Welcome to the Consortium of Universities for Global Health webinar series. My name is Dr. Keith Martin and I'm the Executive Director for CUGH. We have a wonderful webinar today on the Centers for Disease Control, one of the outstanding public institutions in the United States that serves and protects not only Americans but people around the world. Essentially works in two broad areas. One is in the area of infectious diseases to prevent and detect and respond to those uh, lethal infectious causes of illness. And then the second group are the non-communicable diseases. Those diseases such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, respiratory problems, mental health uh, challenges, um, uh, diabetes, and injury that cause more deaths than those caused by infectious diseases. We are very honored today to have one of the CDC's outstanding uh, public servants, Dr. Hamid Jaffrey. Dr. Jaffrey is the principal deputy director for the Center for Global Health at the CDC. And he is also, he was the director of global polio elimination at the WHO. And prior to that, he was the director of global immunization at the CDC. Uh, Dr. Jaffrey, thank you very much for being willing to speak today. Uh, Dr. Jaffrey will speak for about 30 minutes and then we'll turn it over to questions and answers from you. Dr. Jaffrey, over to you. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Martin, and thank, thanks really to the consortium uh, for this important opportunity to, to be able to speak at this, um, at this webinar. So what I'll try to do uh, uh, in the next 30 minutes or so is to give you a quick overview of uh, the Centers for Disease Control and prevention uh, our work, but I'll uh, primarily focus on the, the global health work of the, of the agency. And even within that work, I will talk about, of course, very important disease specific, disease control, eradication and elimination programs. But I'll also particularly focus on our cross cutting work for building um, global health uh, security and the recent uh, advances, particularly in the aftermath of the horrific Ebola outbreak that took the whole world by, by surprise. So CDC is, is uh, one of the agencies of the US Department of Health and Human Services. It's a federal agency, it's the nation's leading public health agency dedicated to uh, saving lives and protecting the health of uh, Americans. Uh, the agency is, is uh, headquartered here uh, in Atlanta, uh, but it also has 10 additional uh, locations um, around, the, around the country here. We are also present with country offices in, in more than 60 uh, countries around the world, so we do have a substantial um, global uh, footprint. Uh, more than 12,000 employees uh, work at CDC and they represent really a, a diversity of, of professional disciplines, about 150 uh, different professional disciplines are represented in the, in the uh, expert workforce here at, uh, at CDC. In um, uh, fiscal year 2017, uh, CDC's budget uh, is $7.2 billion and within that I think it's important to note that two-thirds of uh, uh, this funding actually goes to states and, and local um, health, uh, health services. I thought one of the good ways to talk about, we are of course organized in different centers and offices and, and insti institutes, but I thought the best way perhaps to describe uh, an overview of CDC's work is to look at how its budget is distributed uh, across important public health priorities. So let me start uh, on the slide that you're seeing uh, with the uh, 2.5 billion mentioned at uh, 9 o'clock of this pie chart. Uh, this is really uh, to protect uh, Americans from infectious diseases, emerging in, uh, and zoonotic infectious diseases, HIV, AIDS, viral hepatitis and such, and of course the very important immunization uh, uh, program. Um, uh, a substantial amount of funding is, is, is uh, invested in preparing uh, the country uh, for any uh, public health events or disasters and, and, and emergencies. Then CDC is, is, a, is a center of excellence for 
a number of uh, state-of-the-art laboratories. We have more than 100 uh, uh, highly specialized uh, labs where we maintain really uh, uh, ensure laboratory excellence in, in public health. We also have uh, programs uh, uh, to ensure environmental health, uh, occupational safety, um, um, and health. Uh, and then we have a, um, almost all centers at CDC have global uh, programs and, and investments that they make in international partnerships and, and global uh, uh, programs. Um, a, a fair amount of funding is also invested in, in maintaining the infrastructure and prov providing block grants to, to uh, public health, uh, health departments. And then finally, we have, a, as, as Dr. Martin was mentioning, the burden of chronic diseases. Uh, so we have a very, very large investment in, in chronic disease prevention and health promotion, uh, birth defects, developmental disabilities, and injury prevention and, and, and control. Um, so CDC really works 24-7 to keep uh, America healthy, safe, and, and secure. And to sort of at a high level to summarize our work, we really put science into action, turning public health research into tools and actions to save more lives, and tracking diseases to, uh, to take the pulse of America's, America's health. Um, as I mentioned, we have more than 100 laboratories that identify food and, and waterborne outbreaks and other biosecurity and environmental threats. And we have world-class scientists um, uh, that provide tremendous uh, technical leadership to, to the agency's work to respond, contain, and eliminate health threats. Then, of course, a lot of our focus is in strengthening our communities, working with the state, local, tribal, and territorial health, uh, health uh, uh, departments. Now, um, even though CDC is a, a domestic uh, agency, but it's, it has a long track record in, in global health. So there are, in this slide, you see some important milestones in CDC's global work that, that uh, goes back decades. Uh, earlier on, first travels to overseas um, uh, countries in Southeast Asia for smallpox and cholera outbreaks. Um, CDC was very actively engaged and provided leadership working with WHO to the global eradication of, of smallpox. Uh, and then by uh, 90s, of course, very important HIV, AIDS, TB, and, and, and malaria and polio eradication program with elimination of polio in the Americas. Uh, and then you see the timeline with SARS appearing in 2003, and then recently the, the Ebola outbreak. And you see those, those blocks underneath that describe sort of 20-year blocks of, of CDC's uh, uh, global health program and, and major international outbreak uh, uh, responses. So I think it's important to note that there is a seamless spectrum of our global work that informs our local work and our local expertise and science and experiences and best practices that we have here in the US, we apply those internationally in our global programs and we learn a lot working with governments and our partners internationally and the lessons we learn uh, internationally, we then apply in our domestic programs to, to protect uh, the population here uh, at home. CDC's global um, health expertise really could be summarized in five uh, buckets or, or, or broad areas. Clearly, surveillance and strategic information systems is really the bread and butter work of, of uh, CDC. I've talked about laboratory systems strengthening and CDC supports a number of uh, laboratory networks that support large um, uh, priority global health uh, programs. Uh, public health uh, force strengthening, particularly through our field epidemiology training programs that are operating in 70 or more, more countries. And this is really modeled after the Epidemic Intelligence Service two-year training program that I uh, went through from 92 to 94 here at CDC. And this is fashioned uh, uh, along that program, uh, but is conducted in, in a number of, uh, of countries. Public health emergency uh, uh, response is another uh, important uh, 
um, capacity and, and experience and expertise here at, at, at CDC. And then we have translational implementation and operational research whereby science informs our programs and then our programming, programmatic engagement informs science. So there is this continuous circle of pro science informing programs and public health programs then informing science as they generate uh, real-time data and, and, and evidence. So let me give you a, an overview of the centers for, for, for global health that, that I um, am I'm with. Um, so the center has four uh, divisions, the division of global HIV and TB. Uh, this is the division that also uh, is involved in CDC's part of the uh, PEPFAR program, which is the President's Emergency um, Relief for, for AIDS. Um, uh, and then we have the division of parasitic diseases and malaria, uh, the global immunization division. As Dr. Martin mentioned, I, I at, at one point in time, I was the director of the global immunization division. And then the division of global health uh, uh, protection. And this is the division that is less disease specific focus and does really the cross cutting work of, of core essential public health function. And I'll talk about that some more uh, in my presentation. But one of the important roles that, that uh, the Center for Global Health plays is to, to really facilitate uh, and optimize the work, uh, the global work of our other uh, uh, offices and, and centers here at the CDC. So the Office of Public Health Preparedness and Response, their international work to build capacities for emergency management and response. We, are, we very closely work with them the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases, National Center for HIV AIDS, Viral Hepatitis, Sexually Transmitted Diseases and TB Prevention, and the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases. So we really have a role in facilitating the global work of other, other uh, centers and, and offices at CDC. So our vision, um, uh, CDC's global health strategy vision is a world where people live healthier, safer, and longer lives. Our mission is to protect and improve health globally through science, policy, partnerships, and evidence-based uh, public health action. So we really believe in health impact, improve the health and well-being of people all around the world, um, health security, making sure that we have improved and stronger capabilities to uh, prepare and respond to, to threats, public health threats, and then working with countries and building their uh, public health uh, um, capacities. And then, of course, the organizational capacity to maximize the potential of CDC's uh, uh, global programs so that they can achieve their, their um, impact. So as I mentioned, we have a, a substantial uh, global footprint. And you see these countries here shown in, in red, uh, more than 60 countries where CDC staff are stationed, uh, including uh, uh, staff that are assigned to international organizations. We have a number of secondments to the World Health Organization, but other uh, partners uh, as well, such as the International Federation of the uh, Red Cross, the Food and Agricultural Organization, UNICEF, and, and other um, uh, international organizations. Uh, and the countries shown in blue, while they, we don't have staff stationed um, in, those, in those countries, we have uh, partnerships and, and funding and other investments uh, that are supporting um, international programs uh, in, those, in those areas. We uh, have country offices uh, in a number of countries, and that's where um, on the ground it's a representation of one CDC. It's our, coordinated, uh, uh, our coordination and implementation of, of our priority programs. Uh, in a one CDC approach. So this is an example of, of the Nigeria country office, which has a large global HIV AIDS uh, program under the PEPFAR. We have the Nigeria field epidemiology training program. CDC staff are contributing to President's malaria uh, initiative in that country. And then global immunization division is very involved there, multilaterally in partnership with WHO and other partners in polio eradication, but also through the fellows and, and graduates of the field epidemiology training program that are very actively working in polio eradication and immunization programs in, um, in, in Nigeria. 
we couldn't be successful without a range of our, our partners. Uh, we have partners within the U.S. government, in the private sector, in the philanthropic organizations, United Nations uh, agencies, you see uh, uh, the plethora of important partnerships that, that we work with and work, work through. And Dr. Martin will be happy to see the logo of the Consortium of Universities under the academic institutions here. You're an important partner for us. Now, let me just quickly uh, summarize some of the sort of priorities and impact of our, our divisions, the Division of Global HIV and TB. As I mentioned, it's, it's very active in the PEPFAR uh, uh, program. And if you look at this slide that looks at CDC's contribution to U overall U.S. government's uh, 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 contribution to the PEPFAR uh, program, USAID and other agencies in the U.S. are also involved in the implementation of the uh, 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 President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, the PEPFAR program. So if you look at uh, the women, men, women, and children on antiretroviral treatment around the world, of the 11.5 million that are, are on treatment supported by the, the PEPFAR program, more than half of those, 6.4 million, are CDC's contribution uh, to that, to that uh, uh, impact. And this is truly phenomenal. And similarly, uh, prevention of mother-to-child transmission, 411,000 uh, uh, interventions in this regard of the total of 760,500. Uh, voluntary medical bail circumcision, a very important intervention to reduce transmission of HIV. Uh, uh, CTC's contribution is 6 million from that. And then similarly, screening uh, patients on HIV, positive persons who are uh, under care for HIV infection, screening them for, for uh, TB infection. Uh, you, you see those figures of 3.5 million. And overall, HIV counseling and testing were 45.5 million. And these are data for the fiscal year 2016. So this is just one year data and tremendous um, impact around the world. Uh, moving on to the division of parasitic diseases and, and malaria, um, they, this division provides a state-of-the-art diagnosis and treatment of uh, parasitic diseases in the U.S., um, a specialized diagnosis of, of parasitic diseases in, uh, uh, here in the U.S., a development of new diagnostics, and then they also have specialized medicines that are not uh, otherwise available in the U.S. to treat complicated uh, parasitic diseases in the U.S. Um, their work has led to 6.2 million malaria deaths uh, averted between 2001 and 2015, among children in Africa, really representing a 60% decrease uh, globally. And they have uh, been involved in distribution of 1.6 billion courses uh, of, of treatment. This is largely through mass, uh, mass drug administration for neglected tropical diseases like lymphatic filaria, says, river blindness, and, and others. Global Immunization uh, um, uh, Division is really one of the spearheading partners uh, in uh, uh, global polio eradication. Tremendous progress, uh, nine, more than 99% reduction in the, in the number of wild polio cases since 1988. Only three countries remaining endemic for polio, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Nigeria. But they've also been very much involved um, in the uh, reduction of measles mortality around the world uh, uh, with 79% uh, reduction uh, in measles mortality globally between 2000 and 2014. They're also engaged uh, with the introduction and utilization, improving coverage of not only measles vaccines, but other new and underutilized vaccines, which are estimated to save uh, more than 23 million lives overall uh, between 2011 and, and, and 2020. Now let's talk about the Division of Global Health Protection. This is the division that does cross-cutting work, and it really approaches that in three major sort of goal areas. First is detecting and responding to emergencies, uh, international emergencies, outbreaks, uh, humanitarian crises. Also, this division is very active uh, in promoting global health security through neutralizing threats at the source where the outbreaks emerge. And then, of course, they achieve that, like a lot of our global work, through building uh, partnerships. So let me just walk you through some of the, the sort of numbers 
that reflect the work of this division under the broader umbrella of global health security. So when you look at emergency response, um, um, this division really coordinates an agency-wide global rapid response team, uh, which has uh, more than 400 multidisciplinary CDC staff that are ready to be deployed anywhere in the world in response to an outbreak or a, or a health emergency. Uh, this is complemented by, you see this under this red block, disease detection. Uh, this is our 24-7 uh, scanning of uh, global events um, and, and looking at any uh, indication of, a, of an emerging threat or an outbreak. And every day, more than 30 to 40 outbreaks are monitored and reported daily through this scanning system. And this system is also very closely aligned with WHO and the Global Alert and and response network. So this works together with the international partnership of rapid deployment, but also our own uh, global rapid response team to be ready to respond to, and, and the deployments are constantly ongoing to deal with various health crises around the world. This division is also the one that coordinates the field epidemiology program that I've talked about and has already trained around the world more than 10,000 disease uh, uh, detectives. These are the, the, the well-trained epidemiologists, but also frontline workers that are trained through a shorter uh, training program that are really detecting uh, events, detecting diseases, investigating outbreaks, uh, collecting samples and making sure outbreaks are immediately identified, investigated and controlled. Uh, through our partnerships with countries, we have uh, developed deep research uh, partnerships within countries uh, to do public health applied research, including pathogen uh, uh, discovery. Now, as part of global health security agenda that I will uh, talk about shortly, we have partnered very closely with the World Health Organization in um, conducting these joint external evaluation of countries' core public health capacities, countries that under the international health regulation, this international treaty that all member states of WHO have signed to meet certain core public health capacity requirements. And this is a new initiative uh, that started in February of 2016. Uh, and CDC staff have participated in more than 70% of the 52 joint external evaluations that have been conducted to date and, and, and more on that uh, shortly. So as I mentioned, global health security agenda, uh, US was among the leaders uh, partnering with 30 or more countries in 2014 that launched the global health security agenda really to help, con help countries develop um, core public health capacities. And they focused on 11 targets or what are called action packages, you know, looking at antimicrobial resistance, national laboratory systems, emergency operation centers, linking public health and law enforcement, medical countermeasures, surveillance, uh, disease reporting, workforce development, immunization, biosafety and biosecurity in laboratories to make sure that dangerous pathogens are well secured and contained, zoonotic diseases, and this really brought a focus of one health approach of human health, agriculture, and, and animal health, and other sectors involved in public health working together to promote uh, a global, health, uh, global health security. And um, I should add that within these action packages, obviously CDC, um, its core skills come to what we call the core four uh, action package in the CDC, which is the, the disease surveillance, as I mentioned, laboratory, public health laboratories, uh, emergency uh, uh, operations centers and response management, and the workforce, uh, workforce uh, uh, development. Now, coming back to joint external evaluations, and I think it's important to understand the historic background. Uh, uh, by 2014, only a third of the world's countries were ready uh, or prepared to deal with any outbreak or public health uh, emergency. Part of the challenge was that countries were only required to self-report on their capacities. All of the panels that looked at uh, the experience and lessons learned from the Ebola outbreak, high-level pan panels, all concluded that this has to change that there should be an outside objective and transparent assessment of countries' um, international health regulation capacities. So the GHSA had developed an, an assessment tool 
for looking at countries' capacities around those 11 action packages. So though that GHSA external assessment tool and the IHR evaluation methodology were harmonized and combined into this one single tool and process called the Joint External Evaluation, where a country first does a self-evaluation of its core capacities around 19 technical areas, and then an external team of assessors comes and, and discusses countries' self-evaluation. And this has really changed the conversation around global health security around the world. As I said, 52 countries so far have conducted uh, this external evaluation. Many of the reports are available on the GHSA website and the WHO website, so uh, tremendous transparency has come, in, has come in to look at where are the gaps in countries' capacities to deal with, with public health uh, threats. And in addition to these 52 countries, another 25 are in the, in the pipeline. And many of the countries, donor countries, and the World Bank are now positioning their international assistance and support to countries based on the outcomes of these joint external evaluation for helping countries fill those gaps. Now, a lot of this work of CDC in promoting global health security under the global health security agenda has been financed by a one-time emergency supplement uh, that CDC received um, in the aftermath, uh, in fact, during the peak of the, the Ebola outbreak. CDC received uh, almost $1.8 billion uh, for a period of 2015 to 2019, which is reflected in this pie chart. Uh, of this, $603 million was for the, for the international Ebola response, uh, nearly $600 million for the uh, work in the global health security agenda uh, that I described, and then uh, $571 million for uh, U.S. domestic preparedness uh, for, the, for the Ebola, Ebola threat. And as I said, this is a one-time funding that continues until uh, 2019. I also mentioned that we work very closely with other uh, important global programs and other centers at, at CDC, and this is the NCEZID, the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases, and they are very active in the glo uh, global antimicrobial resistance work under GHSA, and that's one of the action packages. It's one of the 19 technical areas in the Joint External Evaluation, and it's a major uh, health threat globally and to, to Americans here at, at, at home. Um, they, are, have developed, they have developed new and better technologies for emerging infectious diseases, diagnostic tools, and then prioritizing zoonotic diseases in a one health approach, as I mentioned, that better coordination between human and animal health and agriculture as they come together in surveillance and laboratory diagnosis and, and coordinated action at country level. And they are, of course, working with improving outbreak response uh, capacities. Our National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases um, really is the one that uh, plays a major leadership role um, in um, helping countries develop their national influ influenza centers and in helping countries prepare for the influenza uh, pandemic. They are uh, a close partner with uh, WHO in the global uh, influenza uh, surveillance system. They have a tremendous resource of the influenza, uh, which, which is called the influenza reagent resource. So they, they develop state-of-the-art reagents for influenza diagnosis and then distribute that across the network of labs around the world, influenza labs, uh, for state-of-the-art detection and diagnosis of, of uh, um, emerging influenza uh, uh, viruses. They also work with the Partnership for Influenza uh, a vaccination. And in fact, this influenza resource, uh, reagent resource has now broadened uh, to actually provide reagents for other priority diseases free of cost to laboratories around the world. And the most recent example is distribution of, of Zika uh, uh, testing reagents that CDC distributed through this uh, 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 reagent resource uh, uh, process. This center is also involved with, uh, with uh, meningitis in sub-Saharan Africa and, and, and tracking the impact of, of uh, Menafrique, uh, uh, the vaccine introduced in sub-Saharan Africa for type A uh, uh, meningococcal disease. And this is the center that provides the, the tremendous polio virus laboratory, global polio virus laboratory network, one of the specialized labs that develops state-of-the-art sequencing and, and polio detection methodologies is actually 
done in this center, the laboratory in this center. Our Office of Public Health Preparedness and Response, uh, you know, works of course with state and local health departments to help uh, 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 the communities in the U.S. be more resilient and be prepared for public health emergencies, but they are also training uh, uh, response leaders from around the world. They have a four-month fellowship program, and, and uh, officials from more than 10 countries around the world have undergone uh, this training program here at CDC, the Emergency Operations uh, Center, and many of them, they have gone back and immediately were uh, activated their uh, National Emergency Operations Centers in response to threats that their country was was uh, was facing most recently, the person trained from from Democratic Republic of Congo went back and the following week activated the the national EOC in response to the Ebola flare up that happened in in in, in uh, DRC uh, a couple of months ago. They also provide uh, assistance to countries to develop their own public health emergency operation centers and and they are there on site. Uh, providing uh, uh, workshops and, and, and training that have helped a number of countries activate, develop and then activate their emergency operation centers that has reduced their time to detection and immediate response to, uh, to uh, outbreaks and other public health events. So in summary, CDC works 24-7 works at home and globally to reduce threats to the nation's health and economy and CDC scientists and experts here in headquarters, and also those assigned in CDC country offices, embedded in multilateral institutions and organizations, ministries of health, really provide a unique global network focused on really priority global diseases, HIV, malaria, polio, measles, TB, influenza, antimicrobial resistance, and other global health priorities. The, the one time, 2015-2019, uh, emergency appropriations for global health security has really resulted in very important progress towards making the world a more prepared, world better prepared to stop infectious disease outbreaks at their source, uh, working closely with countries to build their capacities. Um, there is still more we must do to protect America and the world from existing and emerging infectious diseases threats. While CDC is involved in controlling known disease threats, these high priority diseases uh, for which we, we are very much engaged. CDC is also now involved very much through global health security agenda in its cross-cutting work to immediately detect and prevent the unpredictable, the threats that we don't know where they will emerge and what they will be to be prepared and then contain them right at the source. And I think what makes CDC a unique agency within the US government and around the world is that it is present on the ground and it is able to overcome programmatic and technical and scientific challenges and can optimize tools and delivery strategies right on the ground, right within, embedded within the populations that are most challenged in the most challenging circumstances and environments, being on the ground then allows the kind of science that informs program and then what the program forces us to evaluate and assess and informs the, the broader scientific public health evidence base. CDC relies on its diverse collaborations and partnerships uh, to advance its uh, uh, shared global health uh, uh, priorities. So thank you, Dr. Martin, and I'll uh, stop here and, and take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Joffrey. That was an outstanding presentation for all who heard. The indispensable uh, work that you and your colleagues are doing at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to protect uh, Americans here in the United States and around the world and also people around the world. The CDC is truly uh, stands on guard for uh, this country and the world to protect uh, everybody. And so we thank you for the tireless work you and your colleagues are doing. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, start a few questions that have, that have come in from the audience. Uh, obviously the most, uh, uh, one that's foremost in many people's minds of the proposed cuts uh, to the CDC's funding. And the question, I'm bundling a few together, is uh, are there any plans that you can share with us in terms of any changes in strategic direction and priorities in global health and programs, um, uh, including uh, finding out 
uh, ways in which funds can be generated from the private sector or other uh, health organizations to make sure that these vital functions that the CDC is engaged in can continue? Well, I think it's important first to state that the, the um, new administration has very clearly stated its commitment to global health security and continuation of the uh, global health security um, agenda. So the interagency and the full U.S. government involvement in, in, in uh, global health security agenda um, will, will continue. And I think one of the strengths of CDC and GHSA in general is the, the partnerships that we have. And those partnerships are not only leveraging our technical cooperation and collaboration with other technical organizations, but it's also a partnership with uh, countries that, you know, the G7 who want to assist countries uh, as well as uh, financing institutions. So, for example, we are working very closely with the World Bank, and the World Bank relies on not only WHO, but also CDC's advice on how best to channel various financing, uh, uh, financing through various financing mechanisms that the World Bank has into priority public health uh, areas. So CDC's work, both through its technical but also its partnership with, with uh, donor countries and, and uh, financing institutions remains very important so that the momentum that has been developed in global health security uh, development uh, 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 continues. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, not surprising, there are a, quite a number of questions from young global health graduates who, are, who would love to be able to work uh, for the CDC and some would like to work with you, Dr. Jaffrey. Can you share with the, the number of uh, young global health graduates who are on this webinar uh, how people can actually engage the CDC and look for employment uh, within the CDC? So I think um, we have a, a um, you know, we have about um, uh, 1,700 staff that are stationed overseas, and the vast majority of those are the locally employed staff um, in, our, in our country offices. So I think that's one channel is to get engaged where there are local CDC offices is to engage with, with the CDC leadership um, in country. We have a couple of other very important entry points into, into global health and international health. One, of course, is the field of epidemiology um, uh, training uh, uh, program. So a number of graduates of these programs, uh, while staying in their country, are involved in a number of international programs. Um, and that's an entry point for it has launched many careers in international and, and, and global, uh, global health. Of course, the um, EIS training program, Epidemic Intelligence Service Program at CDC, is a very important program and, and of course uh, uh, public health professionals are, are encouraged to apply for this two-year training here at, at, at CDC uh, when you come in as a fellow and get trained it's really hands-on public health training so that's a very important entry point not only international health but an entry point into CDC uh, itself. Our global immunization division has a, a very large program called the Stop Transmission of Polio even though it's called Stop Transmission of Polio, it now actually recruits and trains uh, um, public health, uh, uh, young public health graduates, uh, and as well as professionals um, over a period of three weeks in Atlanta, and then they're deployed for a period of four to six months um, uh, around the world to help with uh, strengthening immunization programs, disease surveillance, polio eradication, public health data management, and such, and that's been a very successful program, and these deployments happen twice a year. They send out more than 200 uh, what they call stoppers um, around the world, and 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 it's important uh, that uh, young uh, public health uh, graduates and professionals apply uh, to the. Uh, you can find that on the CDC website. So I'll, I'll stop here. Hopefully, those are some some ideas by which they could they could uh, sort of um, engage with the CDC and and global health. No, thank you. Thank you very much. I know a lot of people will will uh, will find that information very value very valuable. One of the great news stories of last year was, of course, the creation of an Africa CDC, and in part that was uh, a collaboration between your colleagues at the CDC uh, in Atlanta 
and uh, colleagues uh, across the continent of Africa. Can you share with us, Dr. Jaffrey, uh, the relationship between the two institutions and any status about CDC Africa? Yes, of course, I'm uh, happy to. And, and uh, CDC has partnered very closely with the African Union um, and, the, and the developing uh, uh, Africa uh, CDC because their mission is, is, is so important and, and is so aligned with CDC's uh, uh, priorities. So we have uh, currently a couple of our staff who are seconded uh, to the African Union to be working with the newly appointed uh, director of the Africa CDC to help uh, stand up uh, uh, the various uh, technical departments and teams within, within, uh, within Africa CDC. The director, Dr. John N. Kangasong, uh, has had a, a long and illustrious career here um, within CDC with the division of, of global HIV and TB. He's one of the uh, world's leading uh, uh, HIV virologists and laboratory uh, experts. So we are very pleased with his appointment as the director of Africa CDC. And I think the way the Africa CDC is, has defined its priorities um, really complements also the work of World Health Organization. And it's very important for us here at CDC uh, that WHO and Africa CDC continue to work very closely together and in a complementary way as they have started to do. Uh, the regional director, Dr. Moiti, has provided tremendous leadership in this regard that they have, they're really working closely with Africa CDC. Africa CDC really brings some unique assets uh, uh, to the global health, uh, to the regional and continental challenges that Africa, Africa faces. And I think one of those important assets is that it's under the umbrella of African Union. Uh, so it's the heads of state of, the, uh, of African countries uh, that, are, that you know, are really supporting. Uh, so the level of political support and political commitment for public health under the African Union is, is very, very important. And I think Africa CDC will be in a very uh, strategic position to leverage that political and financial support from the, from the um, uh, African heads of, heads of state. Secondly, in terms of the structure, I think the development of these five regional collaborating centers, you know, in South Africa, in East Africa, in West Africa, and in, in, in the Central Africa and North Africa is very, very important because those regional collaborating centers will then be working with the countries in those, in those, uh, uh, within their own uh, uh, regions through their national public health institutes. So we at CDC are also very much involved in helping countries develop their national public health institutes. So there are many entry points where uh, development of workforce capacity, the laboratory system strengthening, uh, establishment of event-based surveillance, antimicrobial resistance, and the development of national public health institutes, the priorities that the Africa CDC has, has, has uh, laid out are really, really very well aligned with our uh, uh, work. And of course, it adds to the overall emergency search capacity uh, uh, the, as Africa CDC starts to to grow and, and develop its, its capacity. So we see this as a very important institution. No, thank you. As I mentioned in the beginning, we know that non-communicable disease and injury uh, kill and cause far more uh, disability than infectious diseases, infectious diseases combined, uh, and really affects low-income countries even harder than high-income countries, although every country is affected. Can you share with us, uh, Dr. Joffrey, what the CDC is doing to prevent uh, non-communicable diseases and, and uh, address the, uh, the injury challenge that is uh, affecting millions of people around the world? Yes, yeah, so, um, so first to say that um, most of the, the, the budget figures that I showed you in, in my, one of my early slides is really all largely focused for the, the non-communicable diseases, is really for the work uh, within the U.S., for our domestic uh, um, NCD um, control efforts. We really don't have uh, specific appropriation for our global work. That said, of course, CDC's primary asset is, uh, uh, asset is its uh, uh, technical experts, you know, the world-class scientists. So I think those scientists, um, and we also have a, a non-communicable disease branch within our Division of Global Health Protection, what they, what they are able to do is to partner 
with many uh, uh, organizations, multilateral organizations, WHO, and the private sector to uh, provide technical assistance uh, uh, to countries and other partnerships uh, for non-communicable disease control. So, for example, we, uh, we have prioritized um, our work in, in uh, reducing global cardiovascular uh, uh, morbidity and mortality through the Global Hearts Initiative. We are very strong partner in the Global Hearts uh, uh, Initiative. Uh, you know, hypertension control, reduction in salt uh, intake, um, and such. The other way we are very much involved with is actually helping countries uh, develop surveillance systems, conducting surveys to actually understand the, their own burden of diseases and to design control programs that make sense to their own epidemiology of, of, uh, of, of non-communicable non -communicable diseases. Um, we also have, uh, you know, this group receives funding from some like, like uh, the Bloomberg Foundation or other partners that contribute through the CDC Foundation uh, to, collect, to conduct these large-scale mobile telephone surveys on non-communicable diseases. Uh, and that provides invaluable information on the burden of disease and the appropriate um, um, interventions. Thank you very much. Um, one question is uh, concerns uh, the relationship between the CDC uh, and the WHO. Can you share with us what synergies exist between the two organizations, how they collaborate? Well, I think maybe um, perhaps my, my bio that you distributed with your uh, announcement perhaps is, is one indication of our close working relationship that, you know, of my, of my 25 years with, the, with CDC. I was actually seconded to the World Health Organization for 16 years of those 25 years. So we have a very close working relationship um, uh, with, uh, with, with WHO. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, staff who are seconded to our common priority programs. We have cooperative agreements with, with WHO in a range of, of, of programs, HIV, TB, malaria, global immunization, global health uh, uh, security. Uh, because so much of our technical and strategic priorities are, are aligned with, with, uh, with WHO. Um, so um, we, and there are parts of the world where we as a, uh, as U.S. government agency cannot operate for a variety of, of, of reasons, but we are still able to impact uh, public health action, uh, health security in those countries through our partnership with, with uh, WHO. And as I mentioned, that we are we partner very closely uh, with WHO in this 24/7 scanning of global health events. We share that information with WHO. Our global rapid response teams work very closely with uh, WHO's uh, uh, rapid response teams, as well as the global alert and and response network. Uh, so we are part of the the steering committee of the global alert and response network. Uh, together with, with WHO. So it's a very deep and long-standing relationship, and we could not have uh, uh, Im a global impact um, if it were not for uh, WHO and our, and our close partnership with WHO. I, I'd like to, com thank you, I'd like to combine actually a couple of questions, uh, and it really relates to the uh, joint external evaluations and the global health security agenda. In your experience, can you share with us some of the big gaps that the CDC has identified in the global health security agenda? And given those gaps, are there any specific skills that the CDC looks for in terms of in terms of hiring? Right. So I think um, one of the big sort of um, light bulbs that go on when a country implements a joint external evaluation is that the self-assessment part of it, which is the most critical part of the joint external evaluation, um, is that they need to convene all the sectors that impact uh, uh, public health. So that's human health, animal health, agriculture, the food industry, um, the, the, security, uh, sec uh, the security sector, points of entry, airport, border controls, all of that. And for, in most countries, when they sit down for self-assessment, it's the first time that these sectors actually come at the table and actually talk about common 
uh, cause, which is which is uh, health security within their own country. So that I think the lack of coordination and how the evaluation process itself is fostering uh, cross-sector coordination and collaboration with a country within a country is very important. So uh, after this evaluation is done, many countries either within the head of state office or through other robust cross-sectoral uh, processes have set up important coordination and collaboration mechanisms uh, um, across the different sectors for, for public health. So I think that's, that's, that's number one. I think the other weakness, of course, is, is that the, uh, is the weakness in uh, uh, zoonotic disease surveillance, weaknesses in, in human uh, uh, disease surveillance, absence of event-based surveillance, uh, lack of emergency operation uh, centers or response management capa capacity, lack of training for incident management uh, 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 systems. Workforce is a tremendous, uh, uh, there's a dearth of public health workforce, so even though FETP is one important source, a lot more is needed to develop a, a public health workforce, particularly veterinary uh, workforce and, and laboratory uh, uh, experts and laboratory scientists in these in these um, uh, in these countries. Those are the gaps that are emerging. So you know, all of these uh, filling those gaps is a is is a long term process. These these don't get done completely. Um, you know, in 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 low resource settings or countries with very weak health infrastructure. Uh, this is a this is a long term uh, process. So this, these first five years are just getting us really started, and we made very good progress. But a lot remains to be done. Coming to sort of recruitment, you can already tell that the gaps in workforce exist across uh, the world. Uh, so that I know that uh, we have we have participants in this webinar from around the world. You know, there is a huge dearth of of uh, a public health workforce of epidemiologists, frontline workers who understand disease surveillance, who can who understand in, uh, investigating disease outbreaks responding to, to emergencies, the incident management system is very much needed. And you really described uh, very well, Dr. Jaffrey, the that uh, how it takes time to build a strong public health platform. That public health platform is vitally important to not only address infectious diseases, but also to address the tsunami of non-communicable diseases that is impacting every, every country in the world. So a question has come in that is close to your heart um, as the former director of global polio elimination of the WHO one of our questioners would like to know from you when are we going to hit the last mile and finish the job when will polio be join smallpox and be eradicated as a disease on this planet you know um, the um, uh, you know somebody I think it was Yogi Berra who said that predictions are, are difficult especially when they involve the future <laughs> and that's that's particularly true for 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 polio because polio virus the very little wild polio virus that remains is in some of the most challenging uh, security and and health systems environment in the world and and the progress in those countries while very impressive it is fragile and um, as you learned the lesson in Nigeria where we thought uh, polio transmission had been stopped, but clearly virus had survived in these um, highly insecure areas where uh, populations affected by militancy were sequestered, and it was after two-year gap that transmission was again detected that it was persisting. So I think while the progress is very, very encouraging, while it seems feasible that you know within this year perhaps the transmission of, of, of wild polio virus would be stopped, we would only gain confidence with the passage of time and most importantly, adequacy of surveillance, both acute flaccid paralysis surveillance and testing of uh, stool specimens collected from AFP cases and the uh, environmental surveillance, that is the sewage and surface water testing in, in priority uh, locations. And we, the more time that goes in the presence of high quality surveillance, the more time that goes without detecting virus, we get increasing confidence. So I think it's very important at this time that we give surveillance uh, the priority that it deserves, make sure that the last remaining children who still need to be vaccinated are, are vaccinated. And if we continue on that trajectory, I think the 
end of polio is near. Well, we did, that's, but we hope that it obviously comes uh, very, very quickly. And you well described, Dr. Joffrey, that that weak public institutions, instability, and insecurity are where diseases uh, breed and can affect every country in the world. And obviously, strengthening those public institutions uh, for stable countries is vital to the health, welfare, and development of, of any nation. Um, this is the last question before we have uh, before we close. Uh, and have a last few concluding comments. Uh, antimicrobial resistance, uh, Dr. Joffrey, uh, can you share with us a little bit briefly about the impact and what the CDC is doing to be able to address this colossal international threat to health? Um, yes, thanks for descri describing that in those terms. Absolutely. I think that is, that is what it is. We are nearly the end of the line with <clears throat> Um, antibiotics. So I think what CDC is doing is, first of all, very practical. Under GHSA, we are working with uh, uh, countries so that every country should have a national plan for um, managing antimicrobial resistance. So I think that's the first thing. And obviously, this national plan involves engagement of multiple sectors, the agriculture sector, the animal sector, the food sector, and of course, the human health sector. The other is, of course, making sure countries have the capacity um, of infection control in hospitals, because you know, in hospitals, um, they are an important uh, uh, environment where um, uh, if in the presence of uh, poor infection control practices is where highly resistant um, uh, microorganisms uh, survive and, 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 and grow and get, um, and not only kill hospitalized patients, but get them uh, into the into the into the communities. I think the other area where where um, our, our um, NCEZID, National Center for Emerging and and Zoonotic Infectious Disease, really focuses on the the you know world experts on this is uh, developing and helping with uh, a diagnostic capacity for detecting uh, uh, a resistance among among um, microorganisms. So the state of the art uh, testing and then. Uh, surveillance strategies around hospitals um, and, and health uh, facilities to be able to track and monitor uh, the emergence of, of, um, of, of uh, resistant uh, um, organisms. And then obviously, uh, the, the whole element of, of sort of regulation, uh, act, you know, uh, the sort of uh, injudicious prescription of, of, of antibiotics for working with providers, with clinicians, um, so that there is a rational approach to use of uh, use of antibiotics, and then finally improving diagnostics for for uh, non-bacterial respiratory diseases. A lot of the inappropriate use of antibiotics is uh, for uh, diseases that are actually not even bacterial in origin. Viral illnesses are, are treated with antimicrobial uh, uh, agents. So that improving diagnostics for for uh, uh, Respiratory viruses, for example, is is another area where the where, where CDC um, focuses on in in improving the fight against uh, antimicrobial resistance. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jaffrey. Uh, Dr. Hamid Jaffrey, Principal Deputy Director for the Centers of Disease Control. We certainly uh, worked you very hard over the last hour. Uh, thank you very much for providing such an eloquent description of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's indispensable work to protect uh, Americans from coast to coast and indeed to be able to keep the world safer for everybody. Um, we are deeply grateful for the work that you and your other public servant colleagues do, uh, which largely goes unsung. And for those who are, who are watching, uh, thank you very much for tuning into this webinar. If you want to find out one of the many stories that the CDC is about the CDC, uh, look at what they did in the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. You can find that heroic story on their website at cugcdc.gov. Uh, uh, I would like to thank um, Dr. Vic Capil, Dr. Tom, uh, Mr. Tom Ampoli at uh, the CDC for for uh, helping us to do this webinar. Uh, Karen Lamb uh, here and Dadil Najjar uh, at our, um, at our uh, uh, office here in Washington, DC. Please look at CUGH's website, cugh.org. 
uh, you will be able to find this webinar on the site and also information about our activities, including our uh, upcoming conference next year, uh, March 15th to the 18th, 18th in New York City. We are accepting abstracts and proposals for breakout sessions now. Please look at that. And uh, also, you can be aware of uh, all of the other work that CUGH is doing. Thank you again for, for joining us, and have a wonderful day. Thank you for the opportunity.